Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here. Uh, this is the first hearing of the Helsinki uh, Commission in this Congress, and I can't think of a more appropriate subject than to talk about the trajectory of democracy, why Hungary matters. I, I want to thank all of our witnesses uh, for being here today. I particularly want to thank Mr. Sayer, who's here from Hungary, uh, to represent uh, that the government, uh, or at le least inform us, is from the, from the country's point of view, what is happening in Hungary. That makes this hearing, I think, even more helpful to us. And I thank you very much uh, for your participation. The progressive inclusion of post-communist countries into transatlantic and European institutions reflected the expansion of democracy and shared values, as well as the realization of aspirations long denied. Indeed, in 1997, the Helsinki Commission held a series of hearings to examine the historic transition to democracy of post-communist candidate countries like Hungary uh, prior to the NATO expansion. I was one uh, among many of the legislators that cheered when Hungary was joined NATO in 1999 and again when Hungary joined EU in 2004, illustrating not only Hungary's post-communist transformation but also Hungary's ability to join alliances of its own choosing and follow a path of, of its own design. Hungary has been a valued friend and partner as we have sought to extend the benefits of democracy in Europe and elsewhere around the globe. But today, concerns have arisen among Hungary's friends. We, the United States, value our friendship and our strategic relationship with Hungary. As a friend, we are concerned about the trajectory of democracy in that country. Over the past two years, Hungary has instituted sweeping and controversial changes to its constitutional framework, effectively remaking the country's entire legal foundation. This has included the adoption of a new constitution, already amended multiple times, including the adoption of a far-reaching Fourth Amendment just days ago, and hundreds of new laws on everything from elections to the media to religious organizations. More than that, these changes have affected the independence of judiciary, the role of the constitutional court, the balance of power, and the basic checks and balances that were in place to safeguard democracy. It seems to me that any country that would undertake such voluminous and profound changes would find itself in the spotlight. But these changes have also coincided with the rise of extremism and tolerance in Hungary. Mob demonstrations have continued to terrorize Roma neighborhoods. Fascist heiress figures have pr promoted in public discourse and in public places. A new law on religious religion stripped scores of minorities, faiths of their legal status as religious organizations overnight, including initially Coptic Christians, Mormons, and Reformed Jewish congregations. Most have been unable to regain legal status, including the Evangelical Methodist Fellowship, a church that had to, that had to survive as an illegal church during the communist period, and today serves many Roma communities. At the same time, the constituencies of Hungary have been redefined on an ethnic basis. Citizenship has been extended into neighborhood states on an ethnic basis, and voting rights now follow that. As the late Ambassador Max Campbellman once observed, minorities are like the canary in the coal mine. In the end, democracy and minority rights stand or fall together. If respect for minorities fall, democracy cannot be far behind. And the rights of persons belonging to ethnic, religious, and linguistic minority groups will likely suffer in the absence of a robust democracy. Max Campbellman who was a long, friend, long time friend of the Helsinki Commission, served with distinction as the head of the U.S. delegation to the seminal 1990 Copenhagen meetings, where some of the most important democracy commitments ever articulated in the OSCE were adopted. The participating states, and I quote from that document, considered that the rule of law does not mean merely a formal legality, which assures regularity and consistency in the achievement and enforcement of democratic order, but justice based on the recognition and full acceptance of the supreme value of the human personality and guaranteed by institutions providing a framework for its fullest expression. They reaffirm that democracy is an inherent element of the rule of law. At issue now is whether Hungary's democratically elected government is steadily eroding the democratic norms to which Hungary has committed itself in the OSCE and elsewhere. And we care about democracy in Hungary, for the people of Hungary, as well as for the example it sets everywhere we seek to promote democracy. I welcome all of our witnesses today, and let me 
uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, it, it really, um, I think this will be a, a hearing that will get a lot of information and, uh, and be able to work together on these issues. Our first witness will be Brent Hartley, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for European Affairs. Mr. Hartley, thank you for being here. I welcome your testimony. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, for inviting me to join you today. Uh, I appreciate very much your continued interest uh, in events in Hungary and in the OSCE more generally. Uh, I, I want to be clear at the outset uh, uh, and echo a bit what you said in your own statement. Uh, Hungary remains a strong ally of the United States. Uh, it is a valued member of two bedrock transatlantic organizations, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe and the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which define and defend democracy in Europe and beyond. However, in the last two years, we've been open about our concerns regarding the state of checks and balances and the independence of key institutions in Hungary. The United States has not been alone in this regard as the Council of Europe, the European Commission, other friends and allies of Hungary, and civil uh, society organizations have expressed similar views. If the government of Hungary does not address these concerns, not only will the lives of Hungarian citizens be affected, but it will also set a bad precedent for OSCE participating states and new members uh, uh, of an aspirants to NATO. Last year marked the 90th anniversary of U.S.-Hungarian diplomatic relations, relations which remain strong based on a common security architecture as NATO allies, a deep economic partnership, and what we believe are fundamental values shared by the American and Hungarian people. However, before Secretary Clinton's June 2011 visit to Hungary, we took notice of Hungary's controversial media law and a new constitution, the fundamental law, portions of which also raised concerns uh, among impartial observers. In both cases, we had concerns about the content and, as well as the process by which they were passed. As we have often said, Hungarian laws should be for Hungarians to decide, but the speed with which these laws were drafted and passed and the lack of serious consultation with different sectors of Hungarian society did not honor the democratic spirit that the people of Hungary have long embraced. Since then, the Hungarian parliament has passed <coughs> scores of laws at an accelerated pace. More than a few of these laws pose threats, in our view, to systemic checks and balances and the independence of key institutions that are the bedrock of mature democracies. Privately and publicly, we expressed our concern to the government of Hungary, as did several European institutions and governments. Unfortunately, in many respects, our message went unheeded. When Hungary's constitutional court struck down a law on fiscal issues, the parliament swiftly passed another law, taking away the court's competency to decide cases based on fiscal matters. The government expanded the constitutional court from 11 to 15 members, allowing the current administration to select the additional justice, justices and thereby alter the court's juridical balance. The new laws created a media council and gave it significant powers to oversee broadcast media, including the right to fine media for, quote, unbalanced coverage, end quote, an unsettlingly vague term. No opposition parties are represented on Hungary's new media council. The council members have nine-year terms and cannot be removed without a two-thirds vote of parliament. The new laws also created a national judicial office and gave it a powerful politically appointed president with a nine-year term and the authority to assign cases to any court she sees fit, a, a recipe for potential abuse. Another new law stripped over 300 religious congregations or communities of their official recognition. To be clear, non-recognized religious groups are still free to practice their faith in Hungary. But in order to regain legal status, religions will have to be approved by two-thirds of the parliament an onerous and unnecessarily politicized mechanism. In mid-2012, as expressions of concern from the United States and Europeans mounted, the Hungarian government responded in constructive ways. The government voluntarily submitted many laws for review by the legal experts of the Council of Europe's Venice Commission. We were further heartened when, earlier this year, Hungary's constitutional court issued several rulings striking down controversial legislation thus affirming its role uh, uh, in constitutional checks and balances. Unfortunately, the government drafted and swiftly passed a new constitutional amendment, the Fourth Amendment, uh, on uh, uh, March 11th, parts of which were uh, reinstated laws that had been struck down by the court. In doing so, the Hungarian government ignored pleas from the Council of Europe, the United States, the European Commission, 
and a number of allies, as well as several respected nonpartisan Hungarian NGOs, to engage in a more careful, deliberative process and allow for Venice Commission review. I would like to address one other area that has provoked much concern, the rise of extremism in Hungary. This phenomenon is sadly not unique uh, to Hungary. The rise in Hungary of the uh, extremist Jobbik party as one of the largest opposition groups in parliament and Jobbik's affiliated paramilitary groups that incite violence are a clear challenge to tolerance. Let me be clear, uh, the ruling Fidesz party is not Jobbik. Fidesz ideology is within the mainstream of center-right politics and its platform is devoid of anti-Semitism or racism. Moreover, we have seen a growing willingness by Hungarian government leaders to condemn anti-Semitic acts and expressions. However, such condemnation is not always perhaps as swift or as resolute as it might be. One concern, that some uh, one concern also is that some local governments in Hungary have, with little objection from the governing party, erected statues and memorials to figures from Hungary's past tainted by their support for fascism and anti-Semitism, and some of those figures have been reintroduced in the, into the national educational curriculum without context. This contributes to a climate of acceptance of extremist ideology in which racism, anti-Semitism, uh, anti-Romani uh, uh, actions, and other forms of intolerance can thrive. We also call upon Hungarian leaders to do more to defend Romani uh, Hungarians who face discrimination, racist speech, and violence that too often goes unanswered. In conclusion, uh, the United States has long enjoyed and benefited from its strong alliance with Hungary and its people. We respect their drive for freedom and democracy that made Hungary a leader in bringing down the Iron Curtain. Just as we continue to do hard work together in Afghanistan and address other challenges around the, the globe, uh, so too will we continue to have a sincere uh, and at times difficult dialogue on the importance of resolu resolutely upholding fun the, uh, the fundamental values that bind us. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me to express the State Department's views on these issues, uh, and I'm available for your questions. Uh, Mr. Hartley, thank you for your, for your, your comments. Uh, let me just ask you a few points. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of the trends that we see in Hungary, we see in other countries in Europe that have made progress towards democracy, but seem to be now moving in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. Hungary is indeed unique because it's our NATO ally. It also has advanced in integration in Europe. Uh, is what is happening in Hungary, what impact does that have on giving uh, strength to other countries uh, that are now going through their second or third election cycle where they're taking action against opposition that many of us think is pretty extreme? Is it legitimating some of the other illegitimate actions in Europe? Is it having a concern that this could erode uh, development in other countries? Well, uh, I, I think the, the short answer is that, the, is that there, there is a concern there. Uh, when Hungary and, and other uh, 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 new members of NATO uh, 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 and the OSCE joined, uh, uh, well, joined NATO after the fall of the, uh, after the, the, fall of the wall uh, and uh, uh, took up their, their uh, positions and the, and the commitments they made in the OSCE following the, the, the fall of communism, uh, they, they fundamentally agreed to a, a certain set of values, democratic values, uh, uh, and uh, to support a, a, a fundamental human rights. When uh, uh, an ally, uh, an OSCE member, uh, and a member of the EU, such as Hungary, uh, begins to take actions that call those commitments uh, into question, then of course it's a, a concern not only for the country uh, itself, for Hungary itself, but for the example that it, it can set for others. Uh, the, uh, uh, as the as the as the bounds of what is permissible get stretched into into directions uh, that we think are 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 are, uh, 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 are, are causes for concern, uh, it it gives space uh, for other countries to consider uh, 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 what they and other governments to consider what they might do in the same vein. Uh, so there's a concern for the example it sets. I've heard it from other countries that have been, that we've had bilaterals with, that they'll use Hungary as an example uh, to justify some of their own conduct uh, and point out very clearly that NATO, that uh, Hungary is one of our NATO allies. Mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, again, by association saying, well, America's okay with that, when in fact, yeah. obviously, we're, we're not. You mentioned the rise of extremism, which is happening in many European mm -hmm. countries. Uh, Jobbik, the uh, party, is not part of government 
but uh, some of its um, uh, actions have been uh, identified with government. Uh, I specifically mentioned the case of Salt Bayer, mm -hmm. uh, who was uh, uh, who is known for his anti-Semitic, anti-Roma uh, comments, uh, receiving uh, a recognition uh, by one of the cabinet members of the current government. Mm -hmm. Uh, there have been other activities that, uh, that of extremists that have been rehabilitated through uh, a recent uh, recognition. Uh, that's um, a real troublesome sign uh, to the Helsinki Commission. Uh, do you have any um, uh, views as to why government officials would be giving legitimacy to those types of extremist uh, and outrageous uh, individuals uh, in trying to legitimate uh, their place in history? Uh, well, uh, first of all, I, I don't, if, if I may, sir, uh, I think um, Jolt Bayer is, is, is a, uh, was a founding member of, Fee, member of Fidesz. I don't think he was a member of Jovic. No, he's uh, not, but he, but, was, uh, but he received uh, an award from uh, yeah. one of the cabinet yes. officials, right? Yeah, no, just, just to clarify that point. Um, uh, well, I, I, I'm, uh, I know you've got a panel of other experts coming up uh, who I think uh, are probably... Uh, uh, in a better position to talk about the, the uh, in internal uh, domestic calculations that might go into something like that. Uh, certainly, we are uh, we are disturbed by by su such uh, actions. Uh, there was uh, also a, a, um, a state award for journalism that was extended to a journalist just in the last several days, uh, who uh, has uh, uh, been known to uh, make anti-Semitic and anti-Roma uh, comments. Uh, and we, uh, our embassy issued a statement today uh, questioning that and, and uh, suggesting that, that uh, the government may want to look for a way to revoke that award. Uh, it is, it, it's disturbing when these things happen. Uh, uh, as, as, I mentioned, as I think I mentioned earlier in my statement, the uh, 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 tolerance of, this, of, of, of intolerant acts uh, simply gives more space and more room uh, for uh, uh, extremist philosophies uh, to grow. Uh, so we're, uh, we, we, uh, we have uh, expressed our concern uh, uh, as a government on, on numerous occasions in the past when these sorts of things have happened and we'll continue to keep a close watch. Thank you. Uh, some of these laws were obviously looking as to how they're going to be implemented. We have the media council that you've already referred mm -hmm. to. We have the religions law. Uh, you have the court changes that were some of which have been struck down by the courts. Now they're, they're changing once again mm -hmm. to try to reaffirm their positions. Um, do we have any indication in our conversations uh, with the Hungarians as to uh, whether they're reacting to some of our concerns, some of the international community's concerns, in the way these laws will be uh, implemented? Uh, well, I think uh, we were uh, uh, encouraged uh, over the course of 2012 uh, by the dialogue, by the the impact that the dialogue that we, uh, uh, the European Commission, the Council of Europe, uh, and others uh, had with, with, with our uh, Hungarian colleagues on a range of these issues. Uh, uh, unfortunately, as, as, as has been mentioned, we were uh, uh, disappointed that, that many of those positive steps with regard uh, uh, to the ju judiciary, media law, things like that, uh, seemed to take a step backward with the adoption on March 11th of, the, uh, of this new con uh, constitutional amendment. Um, we are uh, heartened that the, uh, 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 again, in the spirit of friendship and in the spirit of, of, of uh, uh, engaging a, uh, a country that is uh, a, a co-member of NATO, and I think for, for others, uh, a co-member uh, co of the European Union, uh, there's been, uh, a, 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 I think, more of a, of a public commentary on, on the Hungarian government actions. Uh, we are pleased that they have uh, have apparently agreed to submit the Fourth uh, Amendment uh, to the Venice Commission for review. Uh, we had argued, uh, we'd supported the uh, Secretary General of the Council of Europe uh, in his statement on March 6th uh, that perhaps they would want to do that before they adopt the law rather than after. Uh, we're, they they uh, chose not to do that, but we're pleased that, they're, that they'll go forward with that now. Uh, it is, um, uh, 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 but we, um, uh, so I think that, you know, we're, we're going to remain engaged with them in dialogue. Uh, it's, it's clear that a number of their uh, friends and allies in Europe, uh, whether from international organizations or, or, or uh, uh, bilaterally, will be raising similar concerns. So we're, we're hopeful that that dialogue will, will uh, Will will that they'll they'll be that they'll be responsive to that dialogue. 
Let me tell you one of my major concerns, and that is that a lot of this is being done with minimal amount of transparency. Mm -hmm. It happens. There is no evidence of, uh, of widespread corruption, at least I'm not aware of it, in the Hungarian government. So I want to make it clear my, my, my mm -hmm. concern here. The lack of transparency in many cases lead to corruption. It's, you know, it's how people can get away with uh, personal corruption, which ends up being pretty much part of government. And again, there's no indication of this that I know of in Hungary. But if, the, if they condone a process that allows laws to be made and policies to be implemented with little accountability or transparency, uh, it can breed a more serious problem within the government itself. Has that point been made by uh, our people or Europe in regards to its conversations with Hungary, that the concerns about the process that they've been using in, in getting these laws passed? Uh, the, uh, uh, thank you, sir. The, uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, we've been very concerned about the process. Uh, I think you noted and, and uh, I noted in my statement that we've, uh, the speed with which uh, uh, the, the new constitution has been adopted uh, frequently uh, and other laws frequently with, with uh, uh, major amendments being made, uh, you know, uh, uh, deep into the night uh, before, the, uh, befi before the final vote. We've raised that uh, 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 repeatedly and consistently uh, and, and have uh, suggested uh, that it would be a, a, a better process uh, if they were to consult uh, with the opposition in the parliament to give them a chance to voice their views, if they were to consult with, uh, uh, with civil society uh, and, and otherwise open up the process by which they uh, 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 consider and vote on, on legislation. Which brings me to, I guess, uh, the point that you raised, and that is it's up to Hungary to pass its own laws. It's an it's a independent country. It's a democratic country. Yeah. The laws they pass are subject uh, to uh, their system. Uh, and that we fully uh, support and fully understand. Yes. Uh, what is the appropriate role for the Council of Europe or, or the United States in um, pointing out or commenting on what is happening in Hungary as far as their legislation that's being enacted? Uh, well, I think... Uh, <laughs> Uh, thank you for the question, sir. I, uh, I think, as most people are aware, the United States has never been terribly shy about offering <laughs> advice um, uh, uh, at, 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 at any level of government. The, um, uh, and, uh, but, but seriously, we, uh, uh, we, we, we take uh, the commitments uh, that we and uh, other NATO allies and other members of the OSCE, uh, we take those commitments very seriously. Uh, and regardless of where... Uh, uh, what country or what government uh, uh, it, it may be, if those commitments uh, we feel are, are not being uh, fully observed or uh, in both uh, spirit and letter, uh, then uh, we will voice our concerns. Uh, I'm a little bit hesitant to speak for the Council of Europe, uh, but uh, the Council of Europe, as I understand it, is the keeper of the various uh, human rights uh, and other conventions uh, that that uh, uh, European governments uh, sign up to when they when they join the Council of Europe, uh, and and that is why the Council of Europe and in particular the Venice Commission, which is a a, 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 a body of, of legal experts, uh, has uh, played such an important role uh, both in uh, uh, in addressing some of the issues that have been presented. Uh, 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 in Hungary over the last couple of years, uh, not to mention in other parts of Europe, for instance, the capacity building in, in the Balkans and things like that. Well, I, I agree with that assessment. I, there, we are both signatories to the OSCE, mm -hmm. which gives us the right and re actually the responsibility to, to raise issues where we believe they're out of compliance with the commitments within the OSCE. Uh, we have a we will continue to report on human rights records of all countries, including the United States, mm -hmm. including our own commitments to Helsinki, uh, OSCE. We'll, we'll comment on that. So this, uh, the, that question was sort of um, aimed at pointing out that we all have responsibilities mm -hmm. to point out where we think they're out of compliance with their international or uh, uh, OSCE uh, commitments and that uh, we have a, a right and responsibility to point that out. It's, it's up to Hungary to, to pass the laws that they believe is right for, for 
for the people of their own country. That's right, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Arley. Appreciate your testimony. It's Thank you very much, sir. It's a pleasure to be here. We'll now go to uh, Joseph uh, Sayer, uh, who has been asked by the government of Hungary uh, to represent it here today, and we very much appreciate Mr. Zayer being here. He is accompanied by Gargay Zulash. And yes. And thank you very much. As a soup. Soup, Zulash. I apologize for that. Uh, Gar Arian has never been that good. I appreciate it. I apologize, but we appreciate both of you being here. And as, as I said in my opening statement and in my uh, questions, that uh, Hungary is a, a close friend of the United States, a NATO ally, a, a country that we share a, a common vision. And we very much appreciate uh, the fact that you were present here today. Thank you. Uh, Honorable Chairman uh, Carden, uh, ladies and gentlemen, just uh, by coincidence, a uh, few, week, few weeks ago, my caucus leader of the European Parliament, Joseph Dole, asked me to, uh, that European Parliament is planning to introduce the U.S. Congress-type uh, hearings in, oh. uh, in the European Parliament and asked me to, uh, and appointed me on behalf of our political group, the EPP, to study it. I didn't think at uh, that time that two days later I will get a phone call from my foreign minister <laughs> and uh, I will be just studying this uh, uh, event uh, from inside immediately. Um, but this is, this is just what sometimes happens. I'm glad uh, we could in, be helpful to you in giving you the experience uh, well, of how we help. Definitely to see it from inside is much better than to study it in the school books. Uh, well, it's an honor for me and uh, for my colleague, uh, member of the European Parliament, member of the Hungarian Parliament, uh, Guyas Gergely, uh, to share my views on the state of the Hungarian democracy. I'm a founding member of Fidesz 25 years ago. Uh, I was fighting against communism and later in my capacity as member of the first freely elected Hungarian parliament and since then uh, several times had participated in the preparation of almost every major constitutional change. Recently I had the great honor of being the chairman of the drafting committee on the fundamental law of Hungary um, which included some other members including Gergely Guyas. Uh, I also would like to commemorate that today is the 69th uh, uh, anniversary uh, when Hungary was occupied by the Nazi troops, uh, taking off the final bits of our national independence. Um, as a legislator myself, I would like to express my appreciation, uh, your personal, uh, personal interest uh, and uh, uh, the U.S. Congress and Senate's interest in the sovereign act of the Hungarian nation's historic constitution-making enterprise. I admire your great constitution, and we held it as a compass creating our new one. Just a reference to the previous uh, uh, speaker, I would like to say that uh, our was a little bit uh, longer made in nine months uh, compared to the United States uh, constitution, but we held it as a compass in creating our uh, new one. Uh, elected representatives of our great freedom-loving nations, the American and the Hungarian, should always find appropriate, appropriate occasions to exchange on equal grounds views and experiences on matters of great importance. And what could be more important than a nation's constitution? And what could be more significant part of a nation's sovereignty than creating her own constitution? You, uh, in America, gained your independence more than 200 years ago. In the course of our history, thousands of Hungarians died for Hungary's independence, but finally, we won it only a little more than 20 years ago when the Soviet occupation finally ended. I was there, uh, I was part of that generation which achieved it, and now our task is to consolidate freedom and democracy. Hence, you should be aware of the high sensitivity of our nation towards questions of independence and self-determination. We Hungarians, like you Americans, consider that our nation's own constitution is an exercise of, in democracy that we should conduct ourselves. We listen to advice given in good faith. We learn from the experience of others, as we did in the preparation of our constitution, from the South African to the Spanish constitution. We studied many examples. This is the very reason I am here, but uh, we insist on, the, on our right to decide. 
this is democracy and self-determination that we had been fighting for so long. In the 2010 election, my party won a victory of rare magnitude, it has been already mentioned, obtaining a constitutional majority, more than two-thirds of the seats in the National Assembly. The choice of the Hungarian people was a response to a deep economic, social, and political crisis before 2010. The mismanagement of public finances, public debt, slipping out of control, the co collapse of public security, and skyrocketing corruption were among its symptoms. We also witnessed serious violations and basic human rights by the authorities, the most serious ones concerning the freedom of um, assembly in the autumn of 2006. At those difficult times, we were expecting the support of the democratic community of the world to speak out against state oppression of the citizens' freedoms. Unfortunately, the international community turned a blind eye. For your information, Mr. Chairman, I, broke, I bought a book from, of those events of trespasses of the police against the uh, violation of the right of assembly in 2006, which was one of the reasons why we won so big majority later on. Thank you. Public order was seriously challenged, also by shocking events like the serial killings of our Roma compatriots with clear racist motivations and with the public authorities standing by crippled. In 2010, we received the mandate and the corresponding responsibility to put, put an end to all that. A new constitution was long overdue. All Central and Eastern European countries, except Hungary, has adopted their new democratic constitutions long before. The Venice Commission welcomed the efforts, and I quote, made to establish a constitutional order in line with the common European democratic values and standards and to regulate fundamental rights and freedoms in compliance with the international instruments. This quote is closed. A few words on the recent amendment, which has been already uh, subject of the discussion before. 95% of these provisions, the so-called Fourth Amendment, adopted last week, had been in effect since the entry into force of the new constitution in the form of the so-called transitory provisions of the fundamental law. Uh, we did not intend to change our fundamental law so soon after its adoption, but the Constitutional Court, and I would like to remind whether checks and balances are working in Hungary, annulled some of the transitionary provisions. The provision of the court based on the German constitutional doctrine of obligation of incorporation, which is a very uh, specific uh, doctrine which the Constitutional Court applied, is that the Constitution should be one single act. Therefore, what had to be done was basically copy-paste exercise to incorporate the transitionary provisions to the main text. Hence, the length of the new amendment. I also would like to remind, on the basis of the previous exchange of views, that uh, in Hungary, the Constitution cannot be adopted in an extraordinary procedure in Parliament. So that all the procedural requirements of adopting uh, or amending the Constitution has been met, and it has been a public debate, it has been a, a constitutional discussion on this. Also, I would like to add that originally, when we adopted our own Constitution, uh, we had uh, a survey of 7 million voting rights uh, uh, members of the Hungarian society, has been consulted by 12 different questions about the future constitution. This has been a nationwide consultation. One million responses has arrived back. Back to the Fourth Amendment. The Fourth Amendment was based on the request of the court and not against it, as some critics misleadingly claim. In fact, we do not understand what really could be here the problem. The recent bombastic headlines and judging editorials of certain newspapers failed to under, uh, underpin their argument till now, and they are misleading the public. There are some new elements as well in the Fourth Amendment, and these follow. All assertion, assertions to the contrary, the notwithstanding the Fourth Amendment does not reduce the powers of the Constitutional Court. What it does uh, is exactly the opposite. It adds additional authorities to those having the right to turn to the Constitutional Court. It repeals the rulings of the court passed under the previous constitution, but as specified by an additional amendment uh, before the, the final vote, the court shall remain free to refer to its own previous case law in, in, in its future jurisdiction. Contrary to noisy criticism, 
the amendment does not strip the court of a power of review and annul the constitution text itself or its amendments, since in Hungary, during this existence for two years, for two decades, the constitutional court never had that power, so we couldn't take it off. My definition of the separation of powers that the court interprets but does not legislate the text of the Constitution. In fact, the Fourth Amendment extended the power of the court explicitly, giving the right to scrutinize the constitutionality of the procedure of amending the Constitution, which is a widening of the rights of the constitutional court and not narrowing it. Expressions of anti-Semitism and racism are and should be cause for concern for every democrat. Even though the phenomenon is not new, and unfortunately vice that all over Europe, Hungary is not exception in this respect. Each and every such incident, in my own conviction and the Hungarian government transition, is deplorable and calls for more de determination to eliminate that. Uh, Prime Minister Orban has confirmed in Parliament that the government shall protect every citizen equally, including those to belonging uh, to minorities, and the government will defend every Jewish citizen of Hungary. The only Roma member of the 750-odd members European Parliament, Lilia Jaroka, citizen of my great uh, home city, Sopron, was elected on the list of Fidesz, the only one of an ethnic community numbering about 10 million in Europe. It comes from Fidesz. It was under the Hungarian presidency of the European Union when the first European Roma strategy was adopted. In the Fourth Amendment, we choose to lay the constitutional grounds for civil procedure open for any person in case his or her religious, ethnic, or national community should be seriously offended in dignity. So in the case you mentioned, uh, uh, Senator, about Jolt Bayer, uh, in the case of Jolt Bayer, after this amendment passed, there will be a legal instrument in every Roma, every single Roma person can claim in a civil procedure a remedy uh, from this person who is making such a deplorable statement. This is an, uh, an instrument, uh, and strong long, uh, legal instrument against hate speech for decades uh, demanded by the different Jewish and ethnic communities in, in uh, Hungary. Rabbi Kövesh, leader of the United Hungarian Jewish Congregation, called the relevant article of the draft Fourth Amendment, and I quote, historic step forward in his defense of the dignity of the communities. Our policy is consistent with our ambiguous relations in, in the past. It was the first Orban government which founded the Holocaust Memorial Center in Budapest and included a special Holocaust Remembers Day for the first time in the curriculum of high schools. Yet the latest shining evidence is the International Wallenberg Memorial in, in, in 2012, launched by the second Orban cabinet. The time allotted to my testimony, Mr. Senator, may not be long enough to address all your points raised, but I encourage to look at the amendments closely. We could dismiss your worries in the past in the case of the media law, the law of the judiciary, and I can, can cite many other examples. We welcome your criticism if based on facts and arguments. Foreign Minister Martini had requested the Venice Commission to give its opinion on the Fourth Amendment. We abide by the rules of the European institution and expect the same from others. However, there should not be double standards. I'm deeply convinced that in a constructive dialogue, we can enrich each other's constitutional experience and thus avoid unfounded accusations and dis disagreements arising from misunderstanding. For more details information to make your judgment, I brought you another book, which has been written together with uh, my colleague here on my left, um, on the background uh, of the new constitution on Hungary, uh, with the title Conversations on the Fundamental Row of Hungary. Um, we also opened a Hungarian constitutional library on Amazon.com in English language. Let me close my remarks with the first line of our national anthem, uh, hence the first line of our new constitution. God bless Hungarians. Isten áld meg a magyar. Well, once again, thank you for your for you being here, and thank you for your your testimony. And we appreciate the uh, information you're making available uh, to the commission. Uh, first, let me make an observation, then I have a, a few questions. Uh, for a democratic country, uh, the first election is always a challenge to have a free and fair election uh, after you've been under the dominance of of, uh, of uh, communist uh, regimes. It's always a challenge, but the great test comes in the second, third, and fourth elections as to how you treat the opposition. 
and how you establish an ongoing way to deal with a government and with opposition and different views and how you respect the rights of all people, including those who oppose uh, the government itself. That's the real test of, of a democracy. And therefore, the laws that you look at today uh, need to be laws that protect all the people of Hungary and not just uh, the ability of a ruling party to be able uh, to, uh, to pass laws and their, their policies. And that's one of the reasons that some of these laws give us real pause. Let me mention a few and get your response. You mentioned in your written statement that the, uh, the freedom of the press, uh, the laws that you passed, that uh, you are not aware of any case of censorship or harassment of journalists. Uh, we understand that ATV, a private television station, was warned by the Media Council in February that if ATV characterized the far-right extremist party, Jobbik, as far-right in their broadcast, that they could be fined. Now, I, I, I would like to get your, your view on that, but I can tell you those types of statements have real chilling effects on the freedom of the media, which is a critical ingredient of a democratic state. Uh, well, I didn't have the time in my um, previous statement to, to go on the... Uh, uh, on the uh, freedom of the press. Also, I would like to say that the uh, media law and the uh, correction of the media law, both by the consultation with the European Commission on one hand and later on by the Constitutional Court decision, is also shows a success story about how we can correct a normal conversation. We can finally end up, uh, end up uh, to a... Uh, to a satisfactory result. The European Commission started an infringement procedure concerning the media law, uh, and finally the Hungarian government and the Hungarian parliament changed the media law accordingly. It addressed exactly uh, the questions, which is a wide debate in every country. If you see the debate in the United Kingdom about uh, what are the limits of the uh, freedom of, um, uh, of the media uh, is, uh, is very, very clear. I, I have no knowledge of any fines uh, taken on any media in Hungary. The Hungarian media, if you read it, there are some web pages which are translating Hungarian daily newspapers on the daily grounds. Uh, on, uh, uh, on that, you will see that uh, anything could be said about the Hungarian media, but not that it uh, uh, cannot express anything. Uh, the Hungarian style, anyway, it's a very vivid uh, and open style, uh, which means that uh, uh, we are not hiding our views. Uh, we are we like to speak uh, directly. I also would like to address that um, maybe, maybe even the Helsinki Commission uh, has failed uh, to address uh, the Hungarian socialist government at, after the third election or the fourth election uh, concerning uh, uh, human rights or media regulations. There was a time in Hungary not very long time ago, only eight years ago, when every single newspaper had a background of some kind of socialist ownership, which was one side of the political spectrum. Even the biggest center-right newspaper was in the hand of, uh, indirectly, of uh, entrepreneurs uh, connected to the uh, Socialist Party. The situation is much more balanced now, and for that reason, the Hungarian media is a very open and uh, clear. Um, there is a competition there, both on the market and both of the ideas. Well, we, we don't really take a position on the leaning of any particular media uh, group, but what we will fight for is uh, an open, free, and uh, media that can uh, feel free to investigate and do reports without fear of intimidation. And if there are threats of fines, that has a chilling impact on uh, independent reporting. Uh, I would appreciate if you would investigate what I just said or get at least look into what I just said because the rule of law is not just the laws that you pass but how you implement those laws. And if there is a feeling that you cannot operate an independent press, then there's a concern, and there's at least some who believe that's the case in Hungary. But let me move on to the second point. Uh, you mentioned you received the advice of the Council of Europe in regards to the um, media law. Uh, I have some information as to what they think about your religious commission, law. European Commission. Not European the, Commission. Not the, you're, you're not the Council. Okay. Well, I have the Council of Europe, excuse me on that, uh, on your religious law. Uh, where they say that the act sets a range of requirements that are excessive and based on arbitrary criteria with regards to the recognition of a church, in particular the requirement related to the national and international duration of a religious community and the recognition procedures based on a political decision should be reviewed. 
This recognition confers a number of privileges to churches concerned. The act has led to the deregistration process of hundreds of previously lawfully recognized churches that can hardly be considered in line with international standards. Finally, the act induces to some extent an unequal and, and, and even discriminatory treatment of religious beliefs and communities depending on whether they are recognized or not. That's from the Council of Europe. Any comment? Uh, Chairman. Chairman, if you allow me one sentence uh, still on the previous subject, that uh, any decision of the Media Council uh, is due to uh, uh, court review in Hungary. So if you are not satisfied with the decision, you can go there, and there is an appeal where you can go through of this uh, process. Um, on the Concerning on the religious communities, I think it's a very big and great misunderstanding. Uh, the uh, the uh, paragraph which is dealing with uh, um, media uh, with uh, religious freedom in Hungary states nothing else than your constitution or several constitutions of the world, the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union states, that every single citizen, individually or collectively, has the right to exercise their religion, publicly or in their home. Which means that this, this is what your constitution says. It doesn't go farther than that. However, the European system, and I think the misunderstanding comes from this point, the European system is not about whether an individual or a community can exercise, whether can exercise or not their religion in individually or in a community, but the, in the European system, it's whether about they have some additional rights, whether they are entitled to some taxpayers' money, which means that the, the media, the church law in Hungary is not really about church freedom. I understand that the basis of the First Amendment in this country, it's even prohibited to regulate any religion uh, be because of the, of the ban um, like this. In Hungary, this is also every single community, let it be uh, whatever, I am not giving examples because that always leads to, but any community and any individual can exercise this. There is no restriction of any on this right. What the state in the church law introduces as a procedure is a recognition as a, as a religious community which has some extra claims by cooperating with the state and getting state money getting the taxpayers' money as a support for paying their priest, for uh, having their charity organization, and so on and so. So the church law is going beyond of that, and the church law is a normative law, so you cannot apply it arbitrary. And why two-third majority in the Hungarian parliament is something which is exactly the guarantee of the wide consensus needed on concerning churches. I also would like to add that in the neighboring countries, the same recognition process religious communities becoming churches which are supported by the state is m in number much less. Austria has much less, Slovakia has less uh, state, less churches, Hungary has at the moment 34. Uh, Romania has less, and several European countries have less recognized churches like that. So we have a various regulations in European countries in which the Hungarian is the most uh, Acceptant, accepted the most open system, which is a public system and the transparent procedure, how do you recognize, not as a church, a religious community, <coughs> as a church, but as a religious community which is entitled to taxpayer money. I think the big misunderstanding here lies here. This is about taxpayer money. It's not really a church law. It's church financing law, which doesn't exist in this country because it's prohibited by the First Amendment of your constitution. I, I thank you for that explanation, but I still believe the discriminatory treatment of one church versus another is of concern. Uh, each country has a different set of circumstances. It's a relationship to the faith community, but discrimination against one church versus another is an issue of concern. And I take it it is correct to say that this law did deregister hundreds of previously lawful churches in Hungary. Is that accurate? Uh, yes, and the reason is that the, the state doesn't want to uh, provide taxpayers' money for, for instance, business religions, for re religions which are doing only business. So they are free to exercise their religious 
activity they are face, because that's the first sentence of our constitution, mm -hmm. but they are not recognized as churches which are entitled for taxpayers' money. This is the difference. However, it, it also comes to your, uh, to your statements, uh, Senator, to, to the question of double standards, which I think we have to be very careful. Uh, in Europe, there are several countries, and I don't know, name that because we all know in this, uh, this uh, uh, room uh, which they are. They have state religious, religions. They have state religions, which means that the state religion has extra and specific rights over other churches. They are coming from history, but the Hungarian system, I can assure you, is not discriminatory. The Constitutional Court had a decision on this and gave guidelines, and the new amendment, the Fourth Amendment, made clear how the difference between the religious exercise of our religion in community and uh, the cooperation with the state, which involves uh, taxpayers' uh, money. I understand that point. The, the other area that just doesn't uh, look well is that, as I understand it, to become registered under the law, if you're not registered, you need a two-thirds vote of the parliament. Is that correct? No, no. Uh, there is a procedure in which a religious community, yeah. which is an existing religious community, can ask the recognition as a church, and so entitled for cooperational benefits from the uh, And that requires a two-thirds vote of the That parliament. requires a two-third, a qualified vote in the Hungarian parliament in order to recognize a church for that. But the Fourth Amendment introduces an ex on the request of the Constitutional Court that on procedural basis there is an opportunity to have a review of that in the Constitutional Court, so you can appeal against this decision on procedural basis uh, to the Constitutional Court, which in, in built in an extra guarantee to the process, because that's what the Constitutional Court was, uh, was uh, missing. Which, of course, brings me to the Fourth Amendment and our concern about the independence of the judiciary. You said that you uh, processed that law and put it into, into effect because you were requested to by the court. Yet I understand the former Chief Justice of the Constitutional Court and the former President urged the current President of Austria for, to withhold signing in the Fourth Amendment. Any reason why uh, the former Chief Justice would have concerns that the court I'm really not wanted? aware of uh, Hungary's conflict with Austria, and that that's, that's might be hundred years uh, before. Uh, I, I don't understand the question. Well, yeah. We're concerned about an independent judiciary. You've mentioned several times appeal to the courts. The courts can how, do this. But how does it come to Austria? President of Austria. We are, Did I say Austria? We are hearing on I meant Hungary. I'm we sorry. Hungry. Hungry. My apologies. I meant Hungary. Um, well, on the, what concerns the independence of the judiciary, there are no new rules concerning in this uh, Fourth Amendment concerning the judiciary. All the rules which are included are paste copy from the provisional. Uh, the transitional provisions of the Constitution, which had been adopted in 2011. And in 2011, uh, since 2011, the European Commission, uh, the Council of Europe, the Venice Commission, all studied in very big details, uh, detailed the judiciary. And the day after the Hungarian Parliament voted on the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution, they voted also on the amendment uh, to the judicial law which included basically all the catalog, all the list of uh, which the European Commission demanded. The European Commission made a statement on Tuesday, which was a week ago, uh, about that uh, they were studying, but on the first glance, they see that uh, it complies with the request which has been made. There are no ru new rules uh, in this sense. All the rules which are now incorporated in the Constitution, as I said, uh, it need needed to be taken over from the pr provisional pr uh, just if you ask my view on that, I, I, I don't think that uh, this German concept of incorporation obligation is uh, something which Hungary should apply. Sweden has four constitutions, Austria has two. So there, there are pieces, but that was the constitutional court and we are abide with the rules. But this incorporation concerning the judiciary and the judiciary review is, is nothing new in, in there. What your concern might be about signing the new constitution, the former president of uh, Hungary and the former president of the Constitutional Court was asking the current president uh, for something which is not in line with our constitution. I would say it, uh, he was asking for something which would be unconstitutional. If the president, if President Ader uh, would be signing 
this, we would be sending this amendment to the Constitutional Court, the Constitutional Court should have said that it comes from someone who is not entitled to do that because the constitutional authority in Hungary is not divided. The constitutional authority stands for the legislature, and that's so in the last 24 years in Hungarian constitutional history. Well, I, I very much appreciate your, your uh, explanation and filling in the blanks on, on these issues. <clears throat> I would just point out that the view of the international community, the view of, the, of Europe and the United States, when we look at the changes that you've done to the judiciary, the changes that you've made in your religious laws, the changes that you've made in your media laws, uh, it gives us concern because we are looking beyond the current ruling party. We're looking at how this framework will work for Hungary's future and we see the potential of real problems. So I would just urge you, since you seem very willing to um, seek the advice of Europe uh, and the advice of your friends, to look at our concerns, and we'll be glad to make sure that we follow up and give you more information on this, that it, is, it presents some real serious concerns that your fundamental document, the Constitution, uh, could become a real problem in the future democratic course for Hungary. I, I want to end on, on one additional question. And you commented that all Hungarians uh, have the, uh, the protections, whether they are Roma, whether they are Jewish, all have the uh, protections of the law and will be protected by the government. Uh, I very much appreciate that statement. It's a very important statement, and coming from you, it's a, it's, it means a lot, and I mean that sincerely. I do point out that the Helsinki Commission here in the United States has invested a great deal of our attention to dealing with anti-Semitism, the problems of anti-Semitism, the problems of xenophobia, anti-Muslim activities, the tolerance agenda. We are very proud that we now have special representatives within OSCE that look at best practices in countries and try to provide assistance to promote a better understanding and protection for minorities in all countries uh, of the OSCE and beyond the OSCE itself. And one of the, the leading um, recommendations is to exercise leadership. I remember very vividly when there was a tragedy in Turkey, the bombing of a synagogue, and the president of Turkey went to the synagogue and showed solidarity with the, Tur with the Jewish residents of Turkey. That was a huge <coughs> signal about the, the, uh, the government would not tolerate that type of discriminatory action. When we see in Hungary government officials embracing individuals who are known for their anti-Semitism and their anti-Roma activities, it is just the reverse. It is a, a signal that the government really doesn't care about those issues. And then it allows for more extreme activities within that country to be accepted. Leadership becomes very important, and the government has responsibility to exercise leadership. In Hungary today, we are concerned because we don't see that clear direction by the leaders of the government, the consistent direction, that you will not tolerate discriminatory actions against any Hungarian, a person from the Roma community, Jewish community, any community, and that you will stand up against those who promote that type of extremism to question a person's loyalty based upon their blood as to whether they're Hungarian, that activity needs to be condemned at the highest levels. And we don't see that. Honorable Chairman, uh, may I answer in two parts? The first is for your comment that you uh, view the major and the magnitude of the changes in Hungary uh, with uh, some concern. And I fully understand that. Sometimes myself, I, I work in Brussels, in the European Parliament, uh, I follow the events in Hungary, but sometimes myself lose uh, the track of speed by which these changes are there. But I would like to remind you, and I mentioned it briefly in my uh, original statement, that Hungary was a country at the brink of bankruptcy uh, in 2010. 
the, you really had to start from scratch to build up the new country. And you had to start from scratch from the foundations with the new constitution and then dozens of new cardinal laws to make this country economically, socially work. The reason for changing the judicial system is not of gripping power over the judicial, but because in Budapest, in order to have your first hearing in your very simple case, in a court case, you had to wait uh, couples of months, dozens of months, in order to have your first, uh, first time. So the reason for the judicial review or the changing of the judicial system is making it more effective. There has been criticism that, uh, uh, that the court um, procedure of the Roma uh, killings uh, uh, under the previous uh, government uh, has been too slow. Yes, I agree. And I am also very much insatisfied what was happening there. But exactly this is why we are changing our court system in order to make it a modern, efficient judiciary. No one in the last 60 years has made those efforts. You have to, your institutions, when you are financing it by public money, they have to work. They have to provide the citizens the necessary service. This was not the case in 2010. Corruption, uh, delays, uh, bankruptcy. Uh, Hungary was almost went bankrupt. We had to go to the IMF for, for a quick, uh, 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 quick relief, and so on and so on. Which means that because the country was in so deep difficulty and crisis, you had to use and restart it, as you here use the reset button. We, we push the reset button, and sometimes you do not know why something is happening, because things are connected. But after the time, after the study, and this is why I really recommend you the books which I was bringing you, and I also would like to ask uh, the letter of our ambassadors to on the Freedom House to include in the in the minutes of uh, of this uh, meeting. I will provide it for you, um, which gives more detailed uh, information on these issues uh, on that. But that we should have done. This is why I said that on our board, on our walls, there is a very big burden of responsibility to taking over and changing the country. Our mandate is like that. In Hungary, it borders impossible to get to third majority. But people were so much unsatisfied with the current situation that they wanted change. They wanted big change. And this is what we are doing. Concerning anti-Semitism and uh, the Roma, um, well, first, uh, I would like personally express, maybe let me start on a personal note. Uh, I am not of Jewish origin, but many people in the media, for whatever reasons, they presume that I am. Uh, and I was subject in the media, in the public sphere, in the internet, uh, subject of, uh, of anti-Semitic statements myself. So personally, I also cannot accept and tolerate any kind of intolerance, any kind of racist or anti-Semitic motives, because I know how to be, the, what to be the victim of that. In Hungary, there are living hundreds of uh, th thousands of people of the Jewish community who, whose uh, ancestors and whose family had to survive Holocaust. This is why our president Ader went to the Knesset to express the share of the responsibility of the Hungarian nation just a few months ago, uh, and also to recognize that. This is why the Prime Minister said what I, what, uh, what, uh, I mentioned, that we defend every uh, Hungarian citizen. But all, all the things, and it has been refuted on the highest level. Deputy Prime Minister uh, Tibor Navracic made a very clear statement about the statement of uh, Jolt Bayer, which is a deplorable statement, which is not, cannot be accepted in a democratic uh, society. Uh, so in, in that sense, uh, I think the Hungarian government's stance is clear, and uh, I agree with uh, the previous speaker here in this place, which said that the government is not part of that, and we are not permissive in this area. I don't think that we can afford that, beca because we are not thinking. Fidesz has never been a party which was coquetting uh, with anti-Semitism or any kind of uh, these ideas. We were founding our organization 25 years ago under the communist system exactly in order to fight this kind of uh, uh, thing. So in that sense, your concerns are right, because in every society there are people who are anti-Semite, who are racist, but we have to do the most in order to eliminate and diminish the number of those. I think on this ground, if we start our cooperation 
and our observation of the Hungarian constitution and the constitutional order and rule of law and separation of powers and checks and balances, this could be a good and very firm foundation. And I assure you that the Hungarian government will be always partner on this, not only on the symbolic issues, but also on the ground. Well, I, I think that was a, a, a very fine summary, one I completely agree with. Uh, uh, as I said in, in my opening comments, there's no uh, that we understand that the ruling party uh, is an inclusive party, we, we, that we, we fully understand. What I asked for was leadership against those who, who um, do things that are inappropriate, not in your government, but in your society. We hope they're not in your government. They're not in your government, but uh, there are, we don't want to legitimate uh, the, or give greater credence to those who would uh, uh, affect the rights of all of your citizens. But. I must tell you, I think uh, the, uh, your colleagues have chosen the right person to study the system we have here as far as how hearings are going. You did an extremely effective job. So I know that you'll take back that experience to Europe. And uh, I look forward uh, to continuing uh, this dialogue and this exchange. Uh, you, the Helsinki Commission is set up as the implementing arm for the OSCE commitments. And as I said, uh, we, we uh, very much uh, want to work with our friends in areas that we have concern. And uh, we are, uh, we raise issues not just in Hungary, we've raised issues in the United States of America where we think we're out of compliance with some of those uh, standards. So we very much appreciate your participation here because it did fill in the blanks in many different areas. And we look forward to the continuation of this dialogue and it's been a pleasure to have you before the commission. Chairman, I know it's very unpolite, but uh, I have to say this, that uh, first, I has been always open to this. I know your colleagues, uh, basically many people in this, uh, in this room, consult cons consultations. Uh, we very rarely get this kind of occasions that we ourselves can state our positions. Normally, you hear our views with, with uh, second hand mm -hmm. or third hand or fourth hand or non hand, just some kind of headlines. And uh, I appreciate any kind of dialogue in Hungary, in the United States, mm -hmm. because I am deeply convinced that the Hungarian, the Hungarian democracy is a strong democracy. And we are, Fidesz is a strong democratic party committed uh, to uh, democracy, rule of law, checks and balances. This is our conviction for 25 years. This is why we founded our own organization at that time. And we didn't change it. The circumstances, however, changed. There are very big difficulties in my country. It's not easy to govern a country uh, from the uh, brink of bankruptcy. And for that reason, I really would like to ask you and encourage you to create more occasions when we can speak directly with each other on these issues to avoid misunderstandings, which lead us to bitter uh, disillusionment. Thank you I very much. I think that is a very good suggestion, and uh, I look forward to those types of meetings and to continue to strengthen the ties between our country. Thank you very much. <clears throat> we have a, a third panel that will consist of Dr. Kim Lane Chappelle an expert on constitutional law from Princeton University, uh, Ms. Sylvania Hapdank Koletkovska from Freedom House, and Dr. Paul Shapiro from the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. We thank the three of you for your being here, but also for your patience. Uh, we don't normally have three panels, but it was a I think uh, particularly appropriate that we had a panel uh, from uh, the country involved. So we'll start with Dr. Chappelle. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I am honored to testify before you today. Uh, my remarks will be short. I have much longer written testimony that I would like to enter into the Without record. Without objection, your complete ta all three of your statements will be made part of the committee record. Great, thank you. Um, I am here today because the current Hungarian government has felled the tree of democratic constitutionalism that Hungary planted in 1989. Since its election in 2010, the Fidesz government has created a constitutional frenzy. It won two-thirds of the seats in the parliament in a system where a single two-thirds vote is enough to change the constitution. Twelve times in its first year in office, it amended the constitution that it inherited. Those amendments removed most of the institutional checks that could have stopped what the government did next, which was to install a new constitution. The Fidesz constitution was drafted in secret 
presented to the Parliament with only one month for debate, passed by the votes of only the Fides parliamentary bloc, and signed by a president that Fides had named. Neither the opposition parties, nor civil society organizations, nor the general public had any influence in the constitutional process. There was no popular ratification. This did not stop the constitutional juggernaut. The Constitution, the government has amended its new constitution four times in 15 months. <clears throat> Each time, the government has done so with the votes of only its own political bloc, rejecting all proposals from the political opposition or from civil society groups. So the current Hungarian constitution remains a one-party constitution. We've talked already about the Fourth Amendment passed last week. It is a 15-page amendment to a 45-page constitution. Laszlo Shoyam mentioned earlier the conservative former president of the Hungarian Constitutional Court and of the Republic of Hungary has said in conjunction with the Fourth Amendment that it removes the last traces of separation of powers from the Hungarian constitutional system. Under cover of constitutional reform, the Fidesz government has given itself absolute power. It now has discretion to do virtually anything it wants, even if civil society, the general public, and all other political parties are opposed. The importance of divided and checked powers is, of course, well known, was well known to the American constitutional framers. James Madison wrote in Federalist Number 47, the accumulation of all powers, legislative, executive, and judiciary, in the same hands, whether of one, a few, or many, and whether hereditary, self-appointed, or elective, may be justly pronounced the very definition of tyranny. By James Madison's definition, Hungary is on the verge of tyranny. To demonstrate this, we should start with the basics. Hung Hungary has a unicameral parliamentary system of government. A unicameral parliament has no upper house to check the lower house, no senate to complicate life for the House of Representatives and vice versa, a parliamentary system means that the most powerful executive, that is the prime minister, is elected by the parliament rather than by the people. As a result, the prime minister in Hungary is guaranteed a majority for all of his legislative initiatives. Uh, in 1990, the primary check on this system since that time has been the constitutional court. Unlike a Supreme Court, which is the highest court of appeal in the legal system, as we know in the United States, a constitutional court is the only court that is allowed to hear and decide constitutional questions, and it does nothing else besides rule on constitutional matters. Because the Hungarian constitutional court conducts the primary oversight in a system that has little formal separation of legislative and executive power, it is even more important than the Supreme Court is in the United States. But the Fidesz government has neutralized that court's ability to provide that check. Before 2010, the procedure for electing judges to the Constitutional Court prevented the court from being captured by any one faction. But Fidesz changed the system for electing constitutional judges so that now only a single two-thirds vote of parliament is sufficient to put a judge on the court. And of course, they have the two-thirds. Fidesz also expanded the number of judges on the court from 11 to 15, which gave the governing party four more judges. Think of Roosevelt's court packing plan, only it worked in Hungary. Um, between changing the process for electing judges and expanding the number of judges um, that could be elected by this government, the Fidesz government has been able to elect, as of next month, nine of the 15 judges on this court, all with the votes of only its own par parliamentary bloc. Although, actually, Jobbik voted for a couple of their judges. Um, but even if the court is in Fidesz-friendly hands, a powerful court might still be dangerous to a government that shuns checks on its freedom of action. So the jurisdiction of the court has been cut. Um, Mr. Hartley already mentioned that the power of the court to review budget and tax laws has been, uh, has been cut back so that now the court may never review budget and tax laws passed when the national debt is more than 50 percent of GDP, which will be true for a long time. So let me give you a couple of examples. Um, if a tax law passed this year, infringes an individual's or a corporation's constitutionally guaranteed property rights, or if such a tax is applied selectively to particular minority groups, there is nothing the constitutional court can do in perpetuity. And this opens up a space for the government to violate many personal rights without constitutional oversight. 
Uh, the, Const the Fourth Amendment has also removed from the court the power to review constitutional amendments for substantive conflicts with constitutional principles. Mr. Sire emphasized that actually the court was given the power to review amendments procedurally, which is a power it already had, so at least that power is confirmed, but its ability to review amendments for substance has now been taken away. So for example, to give you just a couple examples of things that have just happened, if the Constitution provides for freedom of religion, but a constitutional amendment requires a two-third parliamentary vote before a church is officially recognized, which has already happened, the court can't review that because it's now in the Constitution. Uh, or if the Constitution says anyone may freely express her opinion, but an amendment, for example, one added last week, says that no one may defame the Hungarian nation, nothing the court can do. So the government can now bypass the constitutional court whenever it wants by simply adding something to the Constitution. The Fourth Amendment also annuls the entire case law of the Constitutional Court from before the Constitution came into effect. No other court in the world has ever had its whole jurisprudence canceled in this way, even when a new Constitution was written. Just to put it in the American context, imagine if the framers had decided to nullify the whole common law before proceeding. It just cuts the ground out from under things that were legally taken for granted. As you know, the, the independence of the ordinary judiciary has also been compromised. Um, the Fidesz government lowered the judicial retirement age, which knocked out the, the senior most 10% of the judiciary, disproportionately the leadership, so 20% of Supreme Court just justices, and uh, more than half of the appeals court presidents were removed from their office in that way. Um, both the Constitutional Court and the European Court of Justice found against Hungary on that matter. And at first, the government defied those uh, court judgments before finally agreeing to restate at least some of the fired judges. But by the time the judges were reinstated, all of the court leadership positions were filled with new judges, which meant that when the old judges were taken back, they were taken into much less important positions. So how were those judgeships filled? The government created something called the National Judicial Office, which has a president who single-handedly has the, the, the power to hire, fire, promote, demote, and discipline all judges without substantive check from any other institution, just this one person. And the Venice Commission has expressed an extraordinary amount of concern over this issue. Um, and so the leadership of the, of the judiciary has been replaced by this one person who, not surprisingly, was elected by a two-thirds vote of the Fidesz parliament. The president of this office also has the power to take a case and to move it to any court in the country other than the one that the law would normally assign it to. Uh, and as you've heard, one of the government's defenses of this uh, is that this is supposed to speed up the processing of cases. Um, but this rationale is belied by the facts. From public sources, I have been monitoring the movement of these cases in the first year that the president of the National Judicial Office has had this power. She has moved only a few dozen cases away from the courts, and these are courts that have thousands of backlog cases. And she has moved these, these cases not to the least crowded courts in the countryside, but to other courts that also have backlogs. So while my statistics cannot reveal the motivation of the government, they can show that the government is not moving a substantial enough number of cases to make a difference in waiting times, and they are not moving cases from the most to the least crowded courts. I'm happy to make the data available if you'd like to see it. So in addition, um, we're worried as well about the electoral framework because the fr legal framework for the 2014 election, a year from now, is still in flux. The Fidesz parliamentary majority has already enacted two election laws over vociferous protests from opposition parties. These laws gen gerrymander the districts for the next election. And it's not just a typical American gerrymand, which happens one state at a time, but this is a national gerrymand. And moreover, all of the boundaries of the electoral districts are put in a law that it will take a two-thirds subsequent vote to change. So it's going to be very difficult to undo. The new law also eliminates the second round of voting for single-member districts, which allows for the first time up candidates without majority support to win a parliamentary seat. Um, and these changes keep going. In fact, the election system is not fixed. The Fourth Amendment actually created a constitutional ban on political advertising during the election campaign in any venue other than in the public broadcast media, which is controlled by the All Fides Media Board. 
There's much more I could say, my testimony. My written testimony says a lot more. And so what I would like to do is just say something about what I think might be done uh, in this, at this intersection. Uh, the Hungarian government vociferously claims that it is still a democracy because the political parties freely organize for democratic elections. But its critics are concerned that the government presently controls the media landscape, has enacted a number of legal provisions that disadvantage opposition parties, and continues to change the electoral rules. The OSCE, which is a specialist in election monitoring, among other things, should insist that the electoral rules be fixed far enough ahead of the election so that all those who want to contest the election have a reasonable amount of time to organize themselves accordingly. In addition, the OSCE should also fully monitor the 2014 Hungarian parliamentary elections. This should, not, it should, this should include not just election day or long-term monitoring missions, the comprehensive changes in the constitutional framework warrants an early needs assessment mission, one that can fully review the effects of all the changes to Hungary's electoral system. Of course, as we've heard here, the US government shares with Hungary membership in both the OSCE and in NATO. Under both of these uh, organizations, Hungary and the US have together committed to a series of democratic principles and human rights. And this gives, I think, the US some substantial interest in monitoring these things. But the US government should also be aware that under pressure, the Fidesz government in the past has promised minor changes to its, to its comprehensive framework, changes that have not, in fact, addressed the most serious problem. And that most serious problem is concentration of political power in the hands of one party. The US should resist entering the battle of competing checklists of constitutional features the Hungarian government also insists that some other European country has the same individual rule that its friends criticize. Perhaps in this connection, we should remember Frankenstein's monster, who was stitched together from, a, from perfectly normal bits of, once, of other once living things, but who nonetheless was a monster. No other constitutional democracy in the world, let alone in Europe, has the combination of features that Hungary now has. We might also say, and this came up actually in the first panel, that other countries in Hungary's neighborhood are looking with great interest at what Hungary is doing. They can see that the EU, the Council of Europe, the OSCE, NATO, and the United States have limited ability to persuade a country to change its domestic laws. Hungary's neighbors understand that Hungary is getting away with consolidating all political power in the hands of one party, and many find that enticing. Troubling recent, troubling recent developments in Romania, Bulgaria, and Slovenia show that the Hungarian disease could spread if the, US and, if the US and its European allies don't stand up for their values in the Hungarian case. In closing then, I would strongly urge the United States, the US Helsinki Commission, and the OSCE to take Hungary seriously, engage with the Hungarian government on matters of constitutional reform, and work toward ensuring that the channels of democratic participation remain open in Hungary so that the Hungarian people retain the capacity to determine the sort of government under which they will live. Thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, for your testimony. Ms. Habdang Kolakowska. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for this opportunity uh, to appear before the commission and uh, discuss certain recent developments affecting civil society in Hungary. Uh, Freedom House's annual Nations in Transit report, which focuses specifically on democratic governance in post-communist countries, uh, as well as our global surveys, Freedom in the World and Freedom of the Press, have all drawn attention to the vulnerabilities and potential threats to democracy created by these legislative changes affecting Hungary's media sector, uh, data protection authority, and judicial system. We remain deeply troubled by the restructuring and restaffing of Hungarian public institutions in a way that appears to decrease their independence from the political leadership. The ongoing use of Fidesz's parliamentary two-thirds majority to insert these and a really striking array of other legislative changes into Hungary's only less than two years old constitution uh, is also extremely troubling, uh, particularly as some of these measures had already been struck down by the Constitutional Court. I was asked to comment specifically <coughs> on recent Hungarian media legislation and uh, law on churches, which I'll do briefly now. Changes introduced in 2010 consolidated media regulation under the supervision of a single entity, 
the National Media in and Info Communications Authority, whose members are elected by a two-thirds majority in Parliament. A subordinate body, the five-person Media Council, is responsible for content uh, regulation. Both the Media Authority and the Media Council currently consist entirely of Fidesz nominees. Uh, and they are headed by a single official who has the authority to nominate the executive directors of all public media. The head of the Media Authority and Media Council <coughs> is appointed by the President for a nine-year term. Uh, this year, the government has responded to criticism of the appointment process by uh, introducing term limits uh, for this particular position and minimum background requirements. However, these will only take effect when the current office holder, uh, when, uh, when their term expires six years from now. The particular issues of concern to us are the broad scope of regulatory control and content requirements. For example, the definition of balanced reporting and the lack of safeguards for the independence of the media authority and media council. Under the revised version of the so-called Hungarian media law, the media council is officially responsible for interpreting and enforcing numerous vaguely worded provisions affecting all print, broadcast, and online media. Uh, the council can fine the media for inciting hatred against individuals, nations, communities, or minorities. It can initiate a regulatory procedure in response to unbalanced reporting in broadcast media, though this no longer applies to print media. Uh, all fines must be paid before an, an appeals process can be initiated. And uh, under the media law, the media authority can also suspend the right to broadcast. The media council is responsible for evaluating bids for broadcast frequencies. Freedom House applauds the council's recent decision to grant a license to the opposition-oriented talk radio station Club Radio for its main frequency in line with a recent court ruling. We regret that it took uh, nearly two years and four court decisions for the council to reverse its original decision, during which time the radio was forced to exist on temporary 60-day licenses, uh, during which time it was extremely difficult for them to attract advertisers. The episode has cast a shadow on public perceptions of the media council, even among those who were previously prepared to believe that a one-party council could function as a politically neutral body. In 2011, the Hungarian national news agency, MTI, became the official source of all public media news content. The government-funded agency publishes nearly all of its news and content online for free and allows media service providers to download and republish them. Uh, news services that rely on paid subscriptions obviously cannot compete uh, with MTI, and the incentive to practice copy-and-paste journalism is extremely high, particularly among smaller outlets with limited resources. The accuracy and objectivity of MTI's reporting has come under criticism since the Orban government came to power in 2010. Under the media law, uh, the funding for all public media is centralized under one body, which is also supervised by the Media Council. Now, Hungary's constitutional court, as we've discussed a little bit, uh, has attempted to push back against some of the more problematic legal changes introduced since 2010. At the end of 2011, it annulled several pieces of legislation affecting the media. Um, these revisions, most of which were confirmed by the parliament in May 2012, represent only a small fraction of those recommended by the Council of Europe. Moreover, they may not even prove permanent given the government's recent habit of ignoring or overruling constitutional court decisions by inserting voided legislation uh, into the constitution. This seems likely to be the fate of the law on churches, which the court struck down last month, but which has already made a reappearance in a proposed constitutional amendment uh, that is currently, well, that has been passed, in fact. Uh, the law essentially strips all but 32 religious groups of their legal status and accompanying financial and tax privileges. The over 300 other previously recognized groups are allowed to apply for official recognition by the parliament, which must approve it by a two-thirds majority. It should be noted that the previous regulations were quite liberal, uh, with associated financial benefits fueling an often opportunistic proliferation of religious groups over the last two decades. However, the new law has the potential to deprive even well-established and legitimate congregations of their official status and privileges. More fundamentally, the law represents another instance in which the parliamentary two-thirds majority has uh, given itself new power over independent civil society activity. The fact that the parliament uh, will have the right to decide what is and is not a legitimate religious organization is without precedent in post-communist Hungary. Uh, as our... <clears throat> As Mr. Sire has mentioned, uh, many of the areas targeted for reform by the Orban administration 
including public media, healthcare, the education system, and even electoral legislation, were in need of reform long before the April 2010 elections brought Fidesz to power. No government until now has felt emboldened or compelled to address so many of these problems systematically, uh, systematically and simultaneously. However, speed and volume in lawmaking cannot come at the expense of quality, which only broad, constitution, broad consultation and proper judicial review can ensure. Nor should reforms create hier hierarchical structures whose top tier again and again is the dominant party in parliament. Voters can still change the ruling party through elections, providing some opportunity for corrective measures. Uh, but the ubiquitous two-thirds majority thresholds in recent legislation make it extremely difficult for any future government to tamper with the legacy of the current administration. Ongoing economic crisis and political frustration in Europe are likely to yield other governments uh, that feel empowered to reject international advice, make sweeping changes that entrench their influence, and weaken checks and balances, damaging democratic development for years to come. But such develop we, we believe that such behavior can be deterred if early examples like the situation in Hungary are resolved in a positive manner. The threats to democracy that Freedom House has observed in Hungary are troubling in their own right, but they are particularly disturbing in the sense that the United States has come to rely on countries of Central Europe to help propel democratization further east and indeed to the rest of the world. The idea that these partners could themselves require closer monitoring and encouragement bodes ill for more difficult cases in Eastern Europe and the Caucasus. Uh, it's therefore essential that the United States and its European counterparts closely coordinate their efforts to address backsliding in countries like Hungary and support them on their way back to a democratic path. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, Dr. Shapiro. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On behalf of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, I'd like to thank the Commission for organizing this important hearing regarding democracy and memory in Hungary. My remarks today will summarize some of the main points of my written statement, and I request that my written statement and be... Instead, all your statements will be Thank put you. in the record. Thank you. Over a hundred years ago, philosopher George Santayana wrote that those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. In mid-1944, the Jewish community of Hungary was assaulted and nearly destroyed in its entirety over the course of just a few months that those losses represented one of every 10 Jewish victims of the Holocaust, one of every three Jews murdered at Auschwitz. Today, the memory of that tragedy is under serious challenge in Hungary, with consequences that we cannot yet fully predict, but which are certainly ominous. In my written remarks, I've provided the Commission with a brief summary of Hungary's Holocaust history. Here, just one minute about this. Under Regent and Head of State Miklos Horty, foreign Jews resident in Hungary were deported to their deaths. Jewish men were forced into labor battalions where tens of thousands died. And over 400,000 Hungarian Jews and at least 28,000 Romani citizens of the country were deported from Hungary to Auschwitz. During the months that followed the removal of Horty from power, in October 1944, the Arrow Cross Party of Ferenc Salashi committed additional atrocities. The record is one of immense tragedy. 600,000 Hungarian Jews murdered out of a total Jewish population of over 800,000, at least 28,000 Romani victims, and significant participation and complicity in the crime by Hungarian authorities from the head of state down to local gendarmes, police, and tax collectors in tiny villages. When one turns to the manner in which the memory of this history has been treated in Hungary since the fall of communism, two distinct phases are visible. The first spanned Viktor Orban's first term as prime minister, 1998 to 2002, when the coalition government that he led established a national Holocaust commemoration day brought Hungary into the International Task Force for Cooperation on Holocaust Education, Remembrance, and Research, and appointed a commission to create the Holocaust Memorial and Documentation Center in Budapest. That center's permanent exhibition is certainly one of the best in Europe. 
Socialist Party governments from 2002 to 2010 remained more or less on this positive path. But the appearance in the middle of the last decade of the openly anti-Semitic and anti-Romani Jobbik party and the paramilitary style Magyar Garda or Hungarian Guard associated with Jobbik brought about a change of atmosphere. Symbols associated with wartime fascism reappeared in public. Incidents of anti-Semitic intimidation and violence increased and anti-Romani discourse took on an increasingly Nazi-like tone. An especially noteworthy portent of change occurred in 2008, when the then out of power, but still powerful Fidesz party, failed to join with other mainstream political parties in forceful condemnation of Jobbik's anti-Semitic and anti-Romani sloganeering and Magyar Garda intimidation of Jews and violence against the Romani population. After Fidesz won the 2010 elections and returned to government with an overpowering two-thirds majority in parliament, the warning signs of 2008 proved to be accurate. Still led by Prime Minister Orban, Fidesz and the Fidesz government changed their approach to issues of the Holocaust. In the judgment of some people, this was done in order to appeal to Jobbik voters. Others were more inclined to see the change as reflecting accurately the prejudices and actual beliefs of Fidesz leaders and membership, was likely some of both. Over the past three years, we've witnessed in Hungary attempts to trivialize and distort the history of the Holocaust. The development of an atmosphere that has given rein to openly anti-Semitic discourse in the country and efforts to rehabilitate political and cultural figures who played a part in Hungary's tragic Holocaust history. This deterioration of a once better state of affairs has predictably gone hand in hand with the broad political trends that the Commission is examining today. For anyone who is familiar with the history of Nazi Germany, Efforts to impose government control on the media, efforts to politicize and undermine the independence of the judiciary, and efforts to deprive certain religious groups of equal status, all echo a past in which propagandistic control of the media stoked race hatred. Perversion of the law led to lawlessness and mass murder, and the delegitimization of a religious community led to the persecution and murder of its members. Racial violence against the Romani minority in Hungary, while not perpetrated by the government, has not been effectively addressed by the government either. And people like Zolt Bayer, a founding member of Fidesz, whose brutal anti-Semitic rhetoric is equaled only by his truly despicable and incendiary anti-Romani slurs, still finds a comfortable political home inside the Fidesz party. Can a party with truly democratic intentions harbor a person who recently called gypsies, quote, cowardly, repulsive, noxious animals that are, quote, again, unfit to live among people, and who incited violence by a call to deal with the Romani population quote again, immediately and by any means necessary. A Fidesz spokesman, with a wink and a nod, allowed that Bayer had penned his hateful words as a journalist, not as a member of Fidesz. With the Fidesz government and change of atmosphere in Hungary has come an assault on the memory of the Holocaust, and this has taken four principal forms. Here I will summarize in, in uh, respect of my time. First came an assault on the history displayed at the Holocaust Memorial and Documentation Center. Series of proposals to change the permanent exhibition were made by Dr. Andras Levente Gall, the then new Fides appointed State Secretary in the Ministry of Public Administration. The first proposal was to eliminate mention of Miklos Horthy's alliance with Adolf Hitler and participation in the dismemberment 
of three neighboring states. Mr. Gall claimed that that was irrelevant to the Holocaust. And yet, violation of post-World War I national boundaries brought war in Europe. War provided cover for the mass murder of the Jews. And it was precisely the Jews of the regions that Hitler restored to Admiral Horthy's Hungary who became the first targets of deportation and death. Gall's second proposal was to sanitize the record of Hungarian collaboration in the ghettoization and deportation of the country's Jews. Then came the so-called Nero affair, and here I cannot go into detail, but it was the speaker of the Hungarian National Assembly, Parliament, founding member of Fides, together with Hungarian State Secretary for Culture, also from Fides, who united with the leader of Jobbik to honor posthumously Josef Nero, a Transylvanian-born writer and fascist ideologue who had been vice chair of the Education Commission in the murderous Arrow Cross regime, and had fled the country together with Salashi in the final days of the war. The plan was to rebury Nero's ashes in Transylvania, while attempting to whip up nationalist sentiment among the ethnic Hungarian minority there through an elaborate official funerary procession that would wend its way by train from the Hungarian border to Nero's birthplace, <coughs> some 200 miles inside Romania. How did the Hungarian government deal with this embarrassing incident? Of course, two members of the government planned it. But there was no rebuke, only a claim, again, that the planners were acting in their personal, not their official capacities. The third route of assault on the Holocaust has been through the inclusion of anti-Semites as positive role models in the national school curriculum, a curriculum that also includes efforts to relativize the significance of the Holocaust. I could explain who the, the anti-Semitic players are. They are in my, in my extended remarks. The curriculum, let, so let me address the second point. The curriculum suggests that teachers treat the Holocaust and Hungarian military losses at Stalingrad as equal tragedies. Now, equating the loss of military forces to an enemy army in battle with the systematic, racially inspired murder of civilian men, women, and children who were citizens of one's own country solely because they were of a different religion or ethnicity, of course makes no sense, unless relativization and distortion of the Holocaust is the goal. Final element in the assault on the Holocaust has been the attempted rehabilitation of Holocaust perpetrators. The most emblematic case is the attempted rehabilitation of Admiral Horty himself. Someone has already referred to statues of Horty, uh, public places being named for him. Uh, when asked to take action to halt the de facto rehabilitation of Miklos Horty, the Hungarian government has responded evasively. The government isn't seeking to rehabilitate Horty, goes the standard line, but it's important to realize that Horty is a controversial figure and that there's no consensus of opinion about his legacy. This, of course, leaves the door wide open. Meanwhile, the government has played to nationalist sentiment, seeking to purge Horthy's record as Hitler's ally, and glorifying the restoration of Hungary's, quote, lost territories, unquote, that Horthy was able to achieve by alliance with Adolf Hitler. The government hasn't taken serious steps to research and more rigorously evaluate Horty's record of anti-Semitism and complicity in the Holocaust. In short, the history of the Holocaust is under assault. And the rehabilitation of some of the people responsible for the murder of 600,000 of the country's Jews is well underway. <clears throat> it's understood that anti-Semitic and anti-Romani discourse, and even intimidation and violence, is not likely to elicit effective government action, 
action to alter the atmosphere or the situation. So the question is what to do. After extensive consultations in the United States, in Hungary, and with members of Prime Minister Orban's government and the Hungarian Embassy in Washington, U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum has encouraged the government of Hungary to take a series of actions. Among them, establish a state-sponsored international commission of scholars to prepare a definitive report on the history of the Holocaust in Hungary, including the history of anti-Semitism, and to make recommendations to the government regarding future Holocaust memorialization, education, and research activities. Enact legislation to prevent the creation of monuments, naming of streets, or other public sites. Honoring individuals who played significant roles in the Holocaust-era wartime governments of the country. Mandate in, Hungarian secondary, in the Hungarian secondary school curriculum that every student in the country visit the Holocaust Memorial and Documentation Center in an organized class visit during his or her final four years of high school education. Ensure that the Speaker of Parliament consistently applies the recently established authority of the Speaker to censure, suspend, and fine MPs for expressions of racist and anti-Semitic views. And take whatever additional steps are necessary to prevent ranking members of government ministries and members of Fides from participating in either public or, quote, private, unquote, capacity in activities that are likely to reinforce racist, anti-Semitic, or anti-Romani prejudices, or that appear to rehabilitate the reputations of individuals who participated in the mass murder of Hungarian Jewry. Our museum has confirmed to the Hungarian government that we stand ready to be helpful in ways that our experience or expertise would allow. Mr. Chairman, democracy and memory are closely interrelated. Undermined democracy and the rights of human beings deemed to be different are easily violated. Misrepresent the tragedies of one's national past and soon it becomes necessary to control the media, manipulate electoral mechanisms, dispense with the legal niceties, and adopt populist and jingoist stances in order to stay in control of the story by staying in power. That outcome is only available in dictatorships, not in democracies. Let me close. I appear here today, our museum appears here today, on behalf of 600,000 Hungarian Jews. And thousands of Hungarian Romani who can't be here. Their lives snuffed out through the decisions, prejudices, and failures of their country's leadership, fascist writers, and ideologues and their fellow citizens who were directly complicit in acts of theft, deportation, and murder. In their late name, let me stress that what happens in Hungary matters. Some weeks ago, Hungary volunteered to assume the chair of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance in 2015. I would hope that before any decision is taken to accept or reject that offer, the Hungarian government will dramatically alter it, the approaches that it has taken in addressing anti-Semitism and Holocaust issues, reverse the current downward trajectory, and guide Hungary onto a path that is admired and praised rather than criticized. Nobel laureate and founding chairman of our museum, Eli Wiesel, who was himself forced into a ghetto by Hungarian gendarmes, and deported with his family to Auschwitz while Miklos Horthy was regent of Hungary, once wrote, if anything can, it is memory that will save humanity. Securing the memory of the Holocaust in Hungary is essential. Thank you, Mr. Chair.
Well, let me thank all three of you for your testimony. I'm, I'm not going to have questions because I think your statements, all three, were very, very comprehensive and very, very clear and, and complete the record. I do want to make a few observations. And uh, First, uh, to Dr. Shapiro, I think you give a very compelling uh, account as to why we have to be very concerned about what we see happening in, Austria, in uh, Hungary as it relates to Holocaust and the revisionists in history and rehabilitation of figures that were involved in the Holocaust. You cannot accept the fact that a person is doing this as a person rather than as a, a government official, and you can't condone silence. Why? Where's the leadership? Where's the Where's the leaders of the country speaking out against these types of actions? I don't see it. So I, I think your concerns are very much uh, uh, warranted for us to be uh, very concerned as to how they will respond uh, to the points that you raise. So I just really want to compliment you on, that, you. Sure. on your complete uh, presentation. Dr. Chappelle, I, want to, I will um, review with ODIR and the Parliamentary Assembly your suggestions on monitoring of the elections. I think that is a important point, and we will do what we can in that regard. I think your comment about this being a one-party constitution is a very valid point. Uh, it's, it's not a constitution that it, it appears to be aimed at the stability of, uh, uh, over the long term of a, a democracy where you're going to have uh, governments that will change over time uh, as, as what happens in a, in a democratic uh, uh, society. You also point out that the changes that were made in Amendment 4, uh, uh, as the Hungarians pointed out, uh, was requested by the courts. Well, maybe it was, knowing the type of courts that were, were appointed there, but it clearly it takes away the independence of the courts. And I must tell you, Ms. Uh, Habdank uh, Kolarczkowska, that the, um, your point about the uh, media laws incorporating conditions that are just not reasonable uh, ha must have a chilling effect. And then, as you said, on the, on the religious laws, it's knocked down by the courts that they're going to put it back in the Constitution, uh, just shows the, uh, uh, the, the failure of the Hungarian government to recognize an independent judiciary. And uh, that is a, a real serious concern uh, as we look at the development of Hungary as a democratic uh, country. And the point that all three of you have made, uh, that what happens in Hungary is important in Hungary, but it's also important in Europe. Uh, there are so many countries that look to what is happening in Hungary and say, you know, uh, maybe we should uh, stack the deck in our favor, and how can uh, the West complain after all their NATO ally is uh, allowed to do this, so why shouldn't we be allowed to do this? So I think it is a, a, a very uh, troublesome uh, development. And uh, we're going to continue to focus on this. We're going to continue to take up the offer of consulting with the Hungarians. And we'll, we'll work with our European friends to point out that uh, these laws uh, do not befit uh, the type of development that Hungary is committed to doing. And we will follow this very, very closely. So again, thank you for all of your, your comments. They were, I said, very, very complete and part of our record. And with that, the commission stands adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. I'm leaving my book.